Well, futurist is an occupation that uh, emerged, I would say, largely in the public in the 1960s in the U.S., a little bit earlier than that in Europe. Uh, we are people who deal with change, of course, and particularly long-term change. A lot of people deal with change on the short-term basis, economists, market research people, folks like that. And they're one to two years. You ask an economist what's going to happen in five years, and they pretty well say, well, my, my, my models don't go out that far, and therefore uh, I can't say. So we're the, we, we pick up after that, five, 10, 15, even 50 years. We try and imagine what could happen so that people can begin to sense that uh, the future will be different than the present and that it will not be useful to simply stay the way they've been. Well, I came to uh, the University of Houston Clear Lake in 1976 to teach sociology and statistics. Was interested in social change, but for some academic uh, reasons, uh, sociologists don't have the time to study long-term change because they can't get publications and they can't get data and they have to have data to be able to publish. It's kind of an academic problem. So um, I was doing sociology, more or less traditional sociology, which is called cross-sectional. So you do surveys, you can get a publication out. You do a little laboratory experiment, you can get a publication out. You can't wait 10 years for data because then you don't get your dissertation done. So I was there, interested in social change. The University of Houston Clear Lake, which is a branch campus of the University of Houston, had established this program called Studies of the Future in 1975. Futures was very hot at that time. This was Alvin Toffler time, uh, Paul Ehrlich, Herman Kahn, uh, the limits to growth. There was a lot of discussion of what was going on in, in the future. And so that they said, well, we took, teach about the past. Why don't we teach about the future? And so they had the opportunity as a brand new university to set up all kinds of unusual degree programs, which were marvelous to start off with. The only one that really survived, at least for almost 30 years, was this futures degree because they hired two very qualified faculty members to run it and they got a reputation. I took it over and, uh, and ran it for 30 years. Retired in 2013 and founded an organization called Teach the Future. I've been teaching graduate students for 30 years. I've given seminars, training programs, public speeches, you name it, you name it, you name it. And when I retired, I realized nobody's talking to young people. Well, in one sense, it's their future. We teach a lot about the past in school. Almost every grade that students go through, they take history classes, which is fine, they should. But the story stops, not even in the present, it usually stops about 40 years before the present because that's how far the teacher gets in the semester. But um, nobody was talking to students about their future, about how the world could be different, preparing them for those kinds of things. And so our, our, our approach is to say that there is one story with three chapters past, present, and future, and that we should think of ourselves as an episode in that story. We're a scene, we're an act, and what are we doing in that act, both in terms of what do we get from our previous generations, and what are we giving, both good and bad, to future generations, and how could that be different? That's a kind of a view that I find very opening and very liberating today because this is not the end of the story. There's still chapters yet to come. We don't know what they will be exactly, but we can talk about them, we can discuss them, and we can anticipate them nevertheless. There are significant societal disruptions in over throughout history, um, and particularly in communication. Um, the invention of writing really allowed for the creation of what we now think of as organized society in terms of the empires of the past because then you could actually govern at a distance. You could communicate at a distance. Uh, the printing press, the telephone, telegraph, broadcast media, all of that stuff was extremely important and each one in its own way created a revolution in society. I think we are in the midst of or on the verge of one beginning with the communications that we're experiencing in the internet and now with the ability for machines to become smart and learn um, that we're on the cusp of another amazing transformation. Now I don't, this is a perfect futures topic because nobody knows what's going to happen. 
<laughs> it's not as though, well, the world will be 9 billion people in another 20 or 30 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this could go in so many different ways. And so whenever anybody begins the discussion of this particular topic, I'm, 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 I just heard one on a podcast this morning, um, every, there are different positions and people articulate their positions extremely well. You take Ray Kurzweil, who says, this is going to be great, there is no problem. And then you take Elon Musk, who says, no, 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 and Bill Gates, no, no, no. Uh, or not, not Gates so much as um, Stephen Hawking. And they're both saying, this is the end of the human race as we know it. So there is a plausible argument to be made in all of those dimensions. So it's a perfect futures topic to begin to think about and talk about. The robots become the workers, what do we do? Uh, and that's happened already. I mean, that started in the 1970s and the 1980s with very simple machines. If you used to go to a restaurant, people had to take orders, they had to cook and all of this stuff. You go to McDonald's and there's somebody with, might even not have a high school education, and they're punching buttons and the machine is doing all the rest. So it's the de-skilling of society. Now that has been, okay, so if you, if you don't get an education, then you got to work at McDonald's. Now if you have machines who know how to design cars, who know how to build bridges, who know how to do accounting and finance, that's the de-skilling of the professional class. And then what, then what do we all do? So how do we prepare for this? The one thing I don't think we have seen quite yet, we may, is the ability to handle non-routine, where creativity and human, the, human capacity for ingenuity and discovery is absolutely crucial to being successful. Now one question of course is are there enough jobs in the world to support a workforce of four or five billion people where creativity and ingenuity are the core of it? But at least right for right now that is the path to success. One has to be able to handle a job, whether it's as an entrepreneur, as a sole proprietor, or even working for a big company. You have to be a unique person. You have to, to Tom Peters called it the brand you. You have to offer a value add that nobody else can do. So preparing to be unique, preparing not just to be one of the mass, because the mass is going away. The machines are taking over mass jobs. The Chinese took over mass jobs to start with, and now in the long run, it's automation and machines that will be doing most of the routine work in society. If you look at the history of work up until even almost the present, routine jobs were the bread and butter of the American middle class. Uh, salespeople, office people, factory people, construction people, they went to work and they did largely routine things most of the time. They didn't have to be creative. In fact, they were discouraged from being creative. We're going to come a time when machines are taking all of those jobs and the only way to earn a decent living is to be creative. Now, are the schools preparing our students for that? Uh, unfortunately, they are not. And that's, that to me is the tra one of the tragedies of our time, is that the schools and the educational institutions, which I have great respect for, most people don't realize how hard it is to go into a classroom every single day and create a learning environment that is engaging, encouraging, and effective. But the, it, but the system itself has not recognized the need to go through a tremendous transformation in order to prepare students for this kind of work. And indeed life, because growing up, having parents, participating in, in civic life is all going to be much different than it used to be.